Thanks be to God for the reading of God's Word. Before I lead us in prayer, we're looking at that first commandment, and I want to focus on that word commandment. The word commandment has kind of a negative sense to it. In the English language, if I say that God commands us, or if we say as parents, a father or a mother, I command you, we're using our authority to do that. And sometimes, if we are parents, our children need to understand that authority, whether they like it or not. But when it comes from God as a commandment, I think sometimes it gets misinterpreted. You see, the Bible was written in what we call Koine Greek. There's three Greek languages. Uh, early Greek, the Middle Greek, which is Biblical Greek, Koine Greek, and then Modern Greek. And sometimes when you have a foreign language against another language, in other words, English trying to meet the needs of Biblical Greek or Koine Greek, you can't find proper words to translate it. Commandment is a harsh term. I command you, we start getting up red flags going, you can't command me. But I think what God was trying to say with the word commandments is their principles that we should want, key word, we should want in our souls. And when Jesus was asked to sum up Christianity as quickly as he can, he would probably say in, in English language, these two principles. One principle, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second principle is love your neighbor as you love God. You see, when you take the word commandment, translate a principle, it's something that we have to choose to want. God can't command anything on us. I wish sometimes that he could, I'll be honest, especially when I watch the news. But the reality is we are creatures of free will. And we have to choose deliberately, like Peter did, to want these principles. Let's think about that as I lead us in prayer. Gracious God, we ask you for the ability right now to break through things that separate us from hearing you so that we can hear the words of the Holy Spirit. And as we look at these two great principles that would be known as commandments, Lord, the truth is we have to decide if we're going to want them in our lives or not. It's up to us. Help us hear you today. I graciously ask, Holy Spirit, with expectation and gratitude and humbly, may the words of my mouth not be mine, but yours, God. Holy Spirit, may I be open to being used by you, and Holy Spirit, may we hear you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we look at these two principles, the first one as in the call to worship today from Mark's Gospel is simply put, to love God with everything we've got. And that's the one we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on it through the way that Peter demonstrated that with a public confession that he actually believed Jesus was the Son of God. But before we go there, let's just back it up and look what's going on in this whole story. You see, Jesus is in a region, and that's like the St. Cloud region, if you know what I mean, the, the greater St. Cloud area or central Minnesota. Jesus was in the region of Caesarea and Philippi, and he takes what I call a Google approach. I don't know about you, but sometimes, and this will explain that I probably need to get a little bit more of a life, but sometimes when I'm really bored and the computer screen is there and Google is there, have you ever done this? You type in your name, spell it correctly, you type in your name, Pastor Bob Candles, K-A-N-D-E-L-S, and then you pray a lot before you hit the enter button. And you pray and you pray and then hit the enter button and hit Google Images and see what comes up. Now... I have done that. Colin, you think about trying that? See what happens. I've done that. And, and the first thing that comes up is the people I've never met. And they're like famous. And I'm like, I don't know how they got under my name. But then you start looking. You scroll down. And you'll see things that pertain to your life. 
maybe an article that was done about you in the newspaper, or maybe something else. And you start seeing things that's going on, explaining or imaging your life. Jesus was doing his version of Google images. He, he looked at his disciples in this region of uh, Philippi and Caesarea, and he said, what are people saying about me? He just looks at them, and he says to them from the Google approach, now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea and Philippi, he asked his disciples, he asked his inner circle of friends, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they answered, they said, some say you're John the Baptist. By now, John the Baptist had been imprisoned by Herod, and he had been beheaded because of his faith in Christ. So he's dead. And some say you're John the Baptist coming back from the dead. Others, Elijah, an Old Testament prophet. Uh, still others say Jeremiah, another Old Testament prophet, uh, coming back from the dead. The key thing here is, everybody thought that Jesus was nothing more than a great miracle person. Are you with me? In other words, they were traveling from great distances to see if they could touch Jesus, to see if they could be healed physically by Jesus, and if they could hear his wisdom. But they never thought for one second yet that he was the son of a triune God. He was the son of God. He was the gift of eternal life. They thought he was a great teacher, a great healer, who was going to die, period. And we're looking at that principle, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. No one was ready to say, hey, I think you're part of a triune God. I don't think you are human. I think you're the savior of the world. No one's getting that image of you. You want to do something, Google Jesus Christ sometimes. Just type that in, spell it correctly, and see what comes up. What images come up for that? But if we want to take that first commandment, that first principle, and put it into practice, then we have to go where Peter was ready to go this day. Jesus wants to know, how much do you love me? As he looks at his disciples and he says, you know what, that's great. I'm glad they think I'm a great teacher. I'm glad they think that I'm possibly a prophet who's come back from the dead. I'm glad they think that I'm a physical healer. But what do you think of me, disciples? That's a big deal. That takes a lot of confidence, not arrogance or anything, but to actually look at your friends and, and, and there's no room to hide the answer. You can't control their answer. I've done this before. It's not fun when I've been in a support group with other ministers. How am I doing? Well, this part you're doing great. But now, but now, we're going to get to the other part. And Jesus looks at his disciples. He says, what do you think of me? Who do you think I am? And all of a sudden, we get an idea or a scriptural principle on what it means to love the Lord your God, capital L, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. To really understand that call to worship this morning. And to really get where that wants me to go with the principle of my soul. If I really want to do that, then I have to understand where the principles of my soul are. It doesn't make us any better than anybody else. It doesn't make us, you know, greater. We're still saved by grace. We're still going to screw up. We're still going to need grace. It's a principle in our soul that really was what he's looking at. Jesus looks at his disciples and says, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answers the question of that first great principle. He says without blinking. He does it because he's honest, not because he wants him to hear the right answer. He just does it because he loves them. He has understood Jesus is more than just a great teacher. He's more than a prophet that came back from the dead. He's more than the male clinic can even offer. You're the Messiah. And the word Messiah means he's part of a triune God. That means he's part of God. The son of the living God. Let me see if I can explain it this way. My um, 
wife. I love her to death. She's with my son today at his church where he's a youth minister at, so I can share this story, but it's springtime, and my life, my wife Kelly likes green grass all over. I, I gotta be honest, I don't even like mowing the lawn, okay? <laughs> and I'm not worried about the green grass all over the earth. I don't even want to mow the lawn. But she wants a green yard. So she started raking where the dog left all his wonderful images uh, last fall, and she got new soil. We, we, we can't just rake it and throw seeds on it. we got to go buy good, rich, dark, black dirt so it can germinate, and it has the best soil properly to grow in. And we gotta, we got to rake it. we got to water it. I just want to mow the lawn once a month. I didn't sign up for all that, man. But she's got all this. And the reason I share that with you is not to go look at her yard and then tell her what I said and get me in all trouble. We got, we got to look at the soil and our principles of our soul. If the soil in our soul is right, and our principle is like Peter, because Peter screws up. We all know that. If you know the story, he ends up denying he even knows Jesus. But not now. If our soil is good and rich and the principle is right, we're going to understand what it means to love God the way Peter answered. We're going to understand what it means to go beyond religion and into Christian faith. The first year that I went to grad school, I went to what I would call a very liberal seminary. Uh, suffice to say, it didn't believe in all of the principles of the Bible. I did not like it there. I obviously transferred, and I went to a grad school, uh, Bethel University, um, in the Twin Cities, and, and got my graduate degree from there. But the first year that I went to grad school, what we call seminary, I was at a class called the Gospels. I don't even remember the professor's name. I'm not going to pick on it. It's not meant to pick on it. But he was teaching the principles of Jesus Christ, the Gospels. And he stated that there's a view out there called the Boltman view of theology that really believes that in the end, Jesus did die, period. Never rose from the dead, but they didn't know how to end the story correctly. So a bunch of people made up the story of his resurrection. This is a true belief. Made up the story of his resurrection so that it would have a proper ending. At first, I thought he was just trying to, to get us to thinking, and he didn't actually believe that, and that he was just trying to stir our minds. That makes sense. So he wrote a paper on why I believe the resurrection is real. And as I got to know him more personally, I'm not making this up, I know it's hard to believe, he actually did not believe in the resurrection. He just believed that Jesus was a good teacher with great principles, possibly healed people, and died. And I remember I did not bring this up to him in class because I wanted to pass the class with a good grade. But I went to see him as an individual and I really talked to him about this. Because that just didn't register with me. I could never buy into that. And as I talked to him, I said, well, what do you believe in? He believes, well, I think Jesus is a great teacher. I think that Jesus healed a lot of people and he had true love, but he just died. I said, when you die, what do you believe in? I believe, he said, I believe there's a better place to go. And if I follow God, I will go there. I'm sorry I did not tell him this because I wanted to get a good grade in the class, but that is a shallow belief. That's not a principle that God's looking for. There's nothing right about that. When Peter said, I believe you're the Lord God, the Messiah, he meant it. In spite of what he did, he meant it in grace of bounds. And what happens? You want to know the difference between religion and Christianity? It's right here in verse 17. It's very simple. And it's right in writing for us. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, that was his name, son of Jonah. Here's the difference between religion and Christianity. Religion, flesh and blood, has not revealed this to you. Religion. You with me? Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Religion. But my Father in heaven, Christianity. Take a good look at that verse. Do we need the institution of the church? You bet we do. But sometimes we get caught up in flesh and blood. 
Do we need Christianity and real faith? Always. But my Father in heaven. Want to get the principle of the first commandment? Get the soil right in our soul. Let grace abound and let it grow. All of a sudden we understand what it means to worship a God that is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And we start understanding real principles. And when we do that, when we do that, we get answers in life that are filled with purpose and call. Religion is coming to church. Religion is doing the right things. Religion is going through the practices. Believing in a Father in heaven and Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God and the power of the Holy Spirit, the resurrection, grace, all of a sudden we move beyond religion and we understand salvation. And what happens? That principle starts acting out in our lives. We start understanding purpose and call. Uh, three years from now, ten years from now, as our graduates from our high school move on, yeah, but also this week, also today, as a mother, as a father, as a person. I tell you, you are Peter, the name Rock. And on this rock I will build my church. Is Peter going to screw up? Yep, he's going to screw up. But is he going to get graced? Yes. Because even in Christ's grace, the gates of Hades can't prevail against grace. And you and I, we just get a glimpse of what it means to understand God with all our mind, our heart, our soul, and our strength. And we get a chance to do that this week. Whether it's at Grace Church, in the community, or somewhere else. Maybe it's at the prayer wall. We get a chance to do that. Maybe it's at Coronas Ministries working on uh, some of the projects. We get a chance to do that this week. And that's what it means to put that first principle into our lives. Amen. Before I close in prayer, I'm going to ask David to put the names of the graduates up there. Some of them were